Hi and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Now coming up on news this week, we have a look at the new Lefty Ocho slightly longer travel single crown left hand leg fork, <laughs> bit of a mouthful there. We also check out the scalpel frame that's been beefed up a little bit to suit that alongside that Pivot 429. So lots of sort of trail, down country, triple XC action going on there. Uh, just to make up for that, we have a look at probably one of the coolest Nuke Proof Giga custom builds ever uh, sent into us, custom paint job on that as well. Uh, and of course, we've got the quiz and some regulars too. Okay, so straight into the show, and I'd like to talk about the best sort of hidden features on bikes. Now, when I say hidden features, I don't necessarily mean things hidden away from sight, just perhaps stuff that's hiding in plain sight that you don't ever really pay that much attention to. You know, we're, we're used to looking at the side-on profile of a bike, seeing the head angle, you know, how clean the sort of top tube line might look, but it's all those smaller details that, um, well, certainly I really appreciate, and I hope that some of you do as well. Now, when I was watching my reactor recently, I was just admiring the sort of the swing link on the top tube there and how just where you can change the shock mount position to adjust the BB height and the internal geometry slightly has got trail and rail written on it. It's the teeniest little detail, but I absolutely love it. I'm a sucker for that sort of attention. I know that Evil do stuff like that on their bikes. They say low and extra low. And I know that Niner have a really cool graphic on some of the top tubes of their bikes. It says pedal, damn it, in that perfect place where you're burying yourself that you've got it there as motivation. I also really like things like grease ports and grease nipples. You know, you see them, uh, Santa Cruz have them on various other bikes. If you flip the bike upside down, look underneath the linkage on the bottom there, you'd often see one tucked away. It's there for business. It's there to make sure that things are working. And it's all this sort of stuff that I really, really love. Uh, one other good example, actually, is the back end of Canyon bikes, the, the quick release axle system that they have. Essentially, it's just an axle that threads into an insert that's on the frame for the Boost 148 system. But it's the lever to actuate it, it hides inside the axle and pulls out, enabling you to do it up and undo it. It's really simple and neat, and I absolutely love these little attention to detail things on a bike. And um, what do you like on bikes? There must be some pretty cool stuff on some of your bikes that maybe it's just for your eyes, the sort of stuff that you appreciate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, there's lots of brands that have done cool stuff. One more good example is uh, Kona. They were uh, partial to putting a lot, a lot of chocolate starfish all over bikes just for their own in-house pleasure. And if you knew about it, it was kind of funny, but um, if you didn't, well, they had a bike called the Stinky and you can um, put two and two together for that. Yeah, and another thing I really like, again, on another one of my bikes that when I was cleaning it a while back was I was just appreciating on the Canyon Spectral, the headset spaces on it. It sounds daft. It's the smallest little detail and it's right there in front of you but the stem and the headset spaces are all profiled to be the exact same shape. And you don't notice it until you go to remove one and you realize how neat and tidy it looks. It looks beefier, but somehow it looks slender. I love it. And it's just right there in front of you and you never notice until you ride in the thing day in, day out. And you're like, hmm, I really like that. It's cool. I like what they have done. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that bike designers have hidden away in plain sight on bikes. So um, let us know what you have on your bike. Uh, is there anything cool that is pretty much for your eyes that no one else appreciates? Pick us up in the uh, pick up the conversation, even in the uh, comments underneath. <laughs> Okay, straight into news, and the first thing I'm extremely excited about, because everyone knows what a fan of Lefty Forks I am, uh, there's a new Lefty Fork on the market. In fact, there's two new Lefty Forks. Uh, the first one, we can gloss over it, because it's not that important, is the gravel fork called Oliver. 30 mil travel. Cool, that's that one done. Now, next up is the Lefty Ocho Single Crown 120 mil travel. Yeah. So when they brought out the 100 mil travel fork, they essentially told me, and I'm sure they told a lot of people, yeah, that's going to be it. We can't make this fork in longer travel because it's just it's too intricate and they've cut away too much weight to be able to make this fork. But here it is. They've got 120 mil travel one. Perfect for down country, for trail, for mountain biking, whatever you want to call it. Triple XC, up country, anything you want. Put a name tag on it. This is the fork that's... that's design for it basically right so it's got 50 mil offset 29 inch wheel only currently uh, it will take up to 200 mil rotors on it there's a few more shots whizzing past you here they say it's quite a lot stiffer than the 100 mil one it's not much longer though it's only three mil longer i think it's something ridiculously short like that uh, but with the increased travel on there so it has got some overlap on there it's slightly heavier i think it's like 60 grams I might be lying there uh, but it's got weight limit on there so the weight limit is 138 kilograms which is about 305 pounds now that's not just for the rider that's combined weight so uh, that's quite a lot of bike and person and gear to be carried on that fork so that should reassure you that it is a 
real strong and tough fork. Now I've got a 100 mil travel lefty just over there, uh, an Ocho fork, and I was actually just about to build up a wheel to put it on a bike, but it's got to be the 120. I really want to try the 120, so uh, I'm going to send this 100 mil one back because that fork, that 120, and it's only a tiny bit longer as well. Oh, oh, oh what a fork! Um, I love the lefty fork. You know I do. I don't need to tell you this anymore, do I? But it's awesome. Okay, so a few numbers for you. So reach is 410 to 470 mil, uh, very XC. I've got to say, on a bike like that with 120 in the XL, I'd rather it's just a little bit longer. Doesn't need to be changing the angles. The angles are great on it. It's got a 67 degree head angle, 74 degree seat angle, which I know the sort of the trail crew at the moment are gonna be like, no, oh, no, it should be 78 degrees. But with the cross country bike, it doesn't matter. You've got to have the compromise to get the frame the right sort of dimensions. So yeah, perhaps you could take that to 76 degrees. Uh, something like that, and then chuck on an extra 20 mil travel. That would be um, a pretty special bike for me, but for what it's intended for, it's absolutely perfect. Uh, they were nearly there with a 100 mil travel frame. It's just this one is basically the same with 120 mil travel. Uh, looks great. There's three models uh, from 4K up to 7K. That's in pounds sterling. I don't currently have euros or US dollars, but uh, hey, here it is on screen. Um, I'm just going to leave you a load of these shots. I think it looks absolutely banging. And actually, Thinking about this bike now, you know, we sort of bandied the term down country around a lot. I know it's not really an official term, but um, it shows what a lot of manufacturers are talking about at the moment. We've seen this before from Santa Cruz, we've seen this before from Trek, we've seen a lot of people going just a little burlier with their XC bikes. It's not to suggest you should thrash these things to the end of their life down the bike park, but it does mean you've got a super lightweight bike that's great for riding across country, but just a bit tougher and a bit more comfortable for some, something slightly a bit harder, you know, all day riding, marathon events even. These are the sorts of bikes, and I think you're gonna see a lot more of them this year. Okay, so next up in news is the Pivot 429. Uh, always been a big Pivot fan, actually. They always make lovely looking frames, uh, based on the DW linkage, of course. They were early adopters of that. And I've got to say, along with Ibis, probably the two best examples of uh, how to utilize the DW link and, and the way it rides. Of course, it's unbelievable for climbing, which both of these manufacturers really excel at. So this one has 29 inch wheels, 120 mil travel. Of course, it fits into that. Triple XE, down country, up country, all day cross country, whatever you want to call it category. Super light and fast is what you need to know. And it's not quite cross country race bike territory. There you go. A great mountain bike for probably more, ma more mountain bikers than, than they realize actually. Uh, a lot of mountain bikers are kind of thinking they need to be riding much bigger bikes. Happy days, but um, you're probably missing out if you think that's all that's out there because these lightweight bikes are phenomenal. Anyhow, so uh, it has a 66 and a half degree head angle, 75 and a half degree seat angle, reach from 410 to 495. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That is a good set of numbers, not too aggressive. They haven't, if you were to make this any slack or any steeper in the seat angle and make the front end longer, you'd end up riding the bike way harder than the weight of the bike would actually allow. This is, I reckon, a perfect sizing uh, on here. I think that's a really good looking setup. So it's got Tronia Mountain Shock, it's got flip chip for geometry alteration, uh, XL to down to excess in sizing. Uh, the top spec has got a Fox Live valve on that. Um, don't know what I think about that. I, I rode a long time ago the EI shock system, which was pretty flipping impressive, using a servo to close and open and um, close and open the compression on shocks. But I've not ridden live valve. I'm definitely curious about it because how fast it works. I guess I'm just not the biggest fan of overcomplicating things, but I do like my tech. So I'll have to try that setup. Uh, look at the downtree protecting on this bike. Doesn't look like a cross country bike, does it? Yeah, so 120 mil is not cross country. It just means that you can have that amazing ride on way less terrain. Or, or if you're a good enough rider, you could take a bike like this to really rowdy terrain um, and tame the terrain. You know, there's loads of different angles, whichever you want to spin on it. Of course, people are still going to love longer travel bikes because you can just plow through stuff. Hey, and that's great fun. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I love that feeling. A um, few more details. There's a cause of a boss on the underside of the top tube there. Uh, they've got a, what looks like a Topeak Ninja cage mounted on there with a, I'm, I'm guessing it inside is one of their multi-tools. A bunch of cool stuff going on. I think it's a really nice looking bike. Um, absolutely love the geometry on this one. This one is definitely where, where I would like to be for this sort of bike. 120 mil, not too long, not too aggressive, just enough to give you all that confidence and stability you need, but it's gonna flatter the light ride of it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Nice one pivot, I think that is a bang on looking bike. 
Pricing though, perhaps not so bang on. So starting at 5,599 US dollars, guess how high it goes up? So this will be the Fox Live valve specs on you. 12,499. <whistles> Has anyone seen the ceramic speed lower cage available for, for various different trailers? And it's got much bigger pulley wheels on there. And the idea is it's supposed to have less sort of uh, less friction, essentially. Uh, designed to be much smoother. I don't know about changing gear or such, but it's gonna, it's gonna be a smoother system. On there with less friction because the chain isn't turning as an acute angle, essentially. Well, if you haven't seen it, have a look at this because this is the Kogel Colossus lower cage available for SRAM Eagle. So it retails for $399. Yeah, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's not exactly cheap, but is a seriously trick. And if you've got a high-end bike, then this might be the product for you. And I think a lot of cross-country and endurance style riders in particular will benefit from the lack of friction in this system. Now it's got a Kogel bearings in there. The thing looks really cool. So they say it's hand-built in the USA. It's got the same cage length as a SRAM Eagle setup. It uses Kogel bearings. It's got massive tension wheel. So they're 14 and 19 tooth pulleys on there. So really sort of opening out that chain instead of making it go around such an acute sort of curve. That's got to help as it? It's got to make a difference. Um, although I'm not sure quite how you would test that. Uh, power meters, I guess, uh, seeing how much power you'd have to put out in a certain gear. Hmm, that's quite a, quite a nerdy thing to do. Uh, so they say it's got the stiffest cage going for ultra precise shifting, customizable colors, i.e. different color wheels, different color, color cages, wild looks, reduced drivetrain friction. Hey, it's got to be a good thing. Uh, 399 bucks, whoo! I mean, don't get me wrong, I put one on a bike, I think it looks like an awesome piece of kit, but, um, is it that much better than what SRAM and Shimano have designed already? I don't know. Would you buy one? Let us know. Okay, now let's dive into comments. Now there's some pretty good ones from last week's show. Uh, first one from Ian Tarry. Basically, he was talking about the custom bike setup. Uh, of course, we were looking at Gustav or Danger Holmes, uh, Scott Hyperspark last week. Uh, incredible bike. So Ian says, um, Alan Milliard's bike with the amazing suspension and gearbox. I'd love to see a bike like his made using the latest tech along with it. Perhaps a collaboration of two of them, a Danger Holmes and Milliard bike. Can you imagine? Especially if they had the full backing of a big bike company or two. Oh, and I know it's a TT bike, but look at the bike Adam Hansen's designed and intends to build himself. Um, do you know what, I don't know much about TT bikes, but I know the guys in GTN are really hot on that, so I'm gonna to speak to them and find out about that. As for a collaboration, I could definitely see a collaboration, but they seem to work very differently. So Danger Holm tends to customize what's already there and is already the pinnacle sort of bikes, and he modifies them, whereas Alan Milliard just basically just starts from scratch. Um, I'm not sure they'd need a big bike company behind them. I reckon, the two of them together could probably come up with something pretty special. Um, completely different characters though, so that'd be mega interesting to see what happens. Uh, next up is from Quantum Quark. I'd love to see someone do an orange specialised fifth element to go with earth, fire, air and water bikes. Yes, I love that film, it looked best on film. Uh, awesome stuff, yeah, and um, probably Probably one of my favorite actresses in any film of all time. A great, great outfit, that too. Uh, next up is from Dennis Pike Photography. Gustav's the best. His bikes are incredible and he's a hilarious dude. His Instagram is gold. Yeah, um, Danger Holmes' Instagram is absolutely amazing. If you don't already follow him, his handle's on the bottom of the screen right there. Uh, give him a follow, go and look at his stuff. He's awesome. Great sense of humor, really cool dude. And uh, look at the bikes he's making. Just beautiful things. Uh, B. Leave says, um, GMBN, how custom can you make a bike? Danger home. Yes. That's pretty much how it goes, I'd imagine. And uh, this comment's gold uh, from Chelsky. Uh, um, never skip leg. I can't even read this properly without laughing now. And this comment cracked me up. Never skip leg day, guy. Sure knows how to build a Scott. Um, in case you're wondering <laughs> what they're talking about, have a look at this shot of Danger Home. Yeah. That's a workout, that's for sure. What a beast. And the next one is from uh, Javier Zainal. Says, uh, forget GMBN, I prefer GCN. Global Cat Network. More screen time for the power monster, please. Hey, I uh, can't guarantee when the cats are around, they kind of just roam and do their own thing. Although I did just see Clarence walk past in the background there. But uh, hey, anytime they're here, they're welcome to come on screen and I'll put them on camera. No problems at all. But uh, yeah, they've, they've got mind of their own. In fact, one of them's out hunting a fox at the moment, I believe. 
Okay, now it's quiz time. You know the drill, three questions coming your way, you're gonna answer the questions and we'll pick them up a bit later on. Okay, so first question firing up on screen right now. We often mention Danger Home, in fact we just did, um, as an incredible builder of ridiculous bikes. Um, when I say ridiculous, I mean in the best sense. He customizes bikes to the absolute limit. Do you know what his real name is? Next question coming up. What bike brand, mountain bike brand, used to have a team called the Fro Riders? And do you know the story why? And last question, pivot bikes use which kind of rear suspension design? Good luck, we'll give you the answers a bit later on. Okay, we're just gonna dive into Rewind now. And actually, this is a uh, submission. It's a photo of me from uh, around 2004. So not super old, but old enough that I'd completely forgotten and didn't even know this image existed. This is the shot on screen right now, taken by Raoul Fortier. Uh, thank you so much, by the way, for sending me this shot and actually for uh, getting in touch. Now, this is at the 2004 Marzocchi press camp for the Triple Eight, the Fort when it launched, so eight inch travel, eight pounds, and I think eight months development or whatever it was, I forget now, there's the three eights, the whole point behind the fork. Now this was my first trip to Whistler. Now I knew nothing about Whistler because we didn't have bike parks in the UK or in Europe really at the time, nothing really existed like that. Whistler was, um, you know, they said you're going to a bike park. I had no idea what to expect. So I turned up, um, open face helmet. Um, I think I might've had knee pads there, just federal BMX, little neoprene things, not even proper knee pads. I had no armor, nothing. I turned up at Whistler and the penny dropped. I was like, oh my God, like this place is ridiculous. Now it's a Marzocchi launch, it was three days of riding. And on, over the three days you had uh, Norco providing a bike for one day, Kona doing it for another day and um, Rocky Mountain for the other day. Uh, nearly forgot there. Now, um, Raoul was actually working on, he was one of the technicians sorting out the bikes for journalists. I just want to read out what he wrote behind because I asked him about the photo. He said, as far as I can remember, it must have been the Norco day. Each day we're driven by a different brand, Norco, Rocky Mountain and Kona. The same, that same year, Rocky Mountain had Brembo prototype brakes on. I totally remember the brakes actually, they were insane. Um, I took this picture because I was standing in the Norco tent helping out setting up journalists and you were my first international bike guy I ever met. I enjoyed our conversation and wanted a souvenir. Um, seriously, Raoul, like, it really means a lot to see this because there's so much stuff. There's, there must be loads of images of me and, and other people I work with floating around that I just don't have, so it's really cool to add this to the collection. But uh, something I specifically remember from this trip was I was the only British person there. In fact, I was one of the only Euro journalists there. There was a load of North American journalists and stuff. And I got, I got there, went up on the chairlift, didn't really know what to ride. All the journalists kind of sort of gathered together and went off on their own sort of ride. And I was just kind of like, well, I want to go and explore. So I went and rode Beeline. So that was actually my first ever trail at Whistler. Again, I didn't know, didn't know what the standards were, didn't know how to sort of set myself against them. Rode Beeline, got to the bottom feeling a bit like, meh, meh it's all right. And I saw Wade Simmons down there in the, in the lift queue. And he was like, hey, you're the, you're the guy from the UK magazine, so come ride with us. And I was like, all right, cool. So ran up on the lift with Wade and Tippy, people that I'd been documenting for uh, three years. And I'd grown up reading about them, seeing them in videos and stuff. So I was totally like, yeah, this is the coolest day ever. Get to the top and they're like, we're gonna go ride A-Line. Can you jump? And I was like, yeah, I can jump. And they're like, cool, come ride with us. And I didn't really realize what I was getting myself into because we had nothing like this in the UK. Bombing down A-line, and I've got um, Brett Tippy in front of me and Wade Simmons behind me. They're calling out the jumps, totally blind, just riding all of them. Felt like an absolute hero riding with them. And actually, a particular thing that makes me laugh about it was, I don't know if anyone remembers, there's a section on, on lower A-line, so you come on that out, out in the gap area. There's like a little step up and you go under a sort of a bridge and you do a right, a right hand sort of a almost 180 degree berm. Now there used to be three tables in a row. The last one you land pretty much into like a descent and that fast descent goes to a right hand catch berm at the bottom, the little bit of netting. Yeah, so as we land from the last jump, we're off the brakes and Tippy's screaming at people, he's like, get the hell out the way. And I'm just like laughing my head off thinking like, what the hell is going on here? And there's people literally just moving out of the way as we went firing straight through the middle. And I'm just thinking like, I hope there's not like a, you know, a 50 foot jump or something coming up, I was gonna kill myself. But, um, but it was great and it taught me a valuable lesson as well. All of the press camps from then on that I went as a journalist, I always rode with the pro riders that were there representing the products. I always noticed that the journalists would sort of team up and go together and help each other take images and you know talk each other out of riding stuff. 
and I found the best thing to do was go and ride with the pros. A lot of people were intimidated by that, but I had nothing to prove and they were pros and I wasn't. So, what, you know, it was only going to be a good thing because they were going to try and make me do stuff and I was going to learn from them and I did. And it's great. And as a result, I'm quite happy riding most terrain these days with most levels of rider because of the fact that I always rode with them. You know, one of the best things you can do on a mountain bike is ride with someone better than you because you're always going to learn. And big thanks actually to Tippy and to, to Wade and Richie Schley and Brian Lopes and Van der Ham um, and all of those sort of early Marzocchi riders that I used to ride with on all those trips because they were super welcoming and uh, I keep in contact with some of them now, which is rad. And cool little trip down memory lane. So thank you once again, Ralph, for sending that shot through. Um, it's good times. Okay, now it's time for Top Mods, which of course is the section of the show where it's dedicated to modifying your bike. Now that could be a complete custom build, it could be changing your handlebar grips, anything counts and you're all welcome. There's a link right here and there's another one in the description underneath, click through on that, send us some pictures of your bikes and show us what you've been doing to them. Literally anything counts, we love seeing this stuff. Now this week's got a bit of a different one. Now there's a photographer called Brad Wakefield that I follow. Um, I'm in contact with him quite a lot over Instagram. He takes some incredible shots, a lot of them landscape, a lot of them aerial as well. Uh, there's a few shots of his just firing by on screen. Uh, give him a follow. Uh, his Instagram handle is right there. Beautiful stuff. Anyhow, he's also a keen mountain biker. And he said, oh, I've taken some shots of a custom nuke proof you might be interested in. We obviously ride nuke proof, so I was thinking, hmm, can it be that good? But he sent me these shots. Ho, 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 look at it. Uh, I'm just going to look at the shots again on screen myself. Okay, so the bike belongs to Luke Williams, and he rides for a shop called Amp Cycle Works. In fact, both of their Instagram handles, uh, Amp Cycle Works on screen and Luke Williams as well. Give him a follow. Uh, really cool stuff. He's also got a matching reactor. I mean, that takes a Michael, doesn't it? Uh, and he's got those Carter Tech pedals on there as well. They look um, especially cool, don't they? But I've got to say, I mean, the colour, like a candy red, like absolutely beautiful. It looks slightly metallic, although kind of hard to tell on my screen, which is absolutely filthy. Um, SRAM AXS on there. It's got the RockShox Zeb on the front, Mazda tyres, DT Swiss rims. I mean, it's absolutely loaded. I love that colour. And I really like actually the, uh, the slick graphic there by the top tube. Really nice out having all, all your sponsors in a single place. Southwest Auto Body, ATL, Amp Cycle Works, Carter Technology. Yeah, like rad shots, really, really nice. Um, I'm gonna go for a ride with Brad soon, actually, because I wanna talk about cameras. Interested to know what lenses and stuff you're using on this and all your settings and stuff. Lovely pictures, dude, like so crisp. That one of the valve, look how sharp that is. Lovely depth of field there. I mean, the bike, oh, hero shots. I love a custom bike. Who doesn't? Who doesn't love a custom bike? We all do, don't we? Whether you've got one or not, it's nice to look at. Gives you ideas, stuff. I'm getting the need to build another bike. Remember when we did the bike build project? Um, I built the bike up on a show with a load of your ideas and then we gave it away. I feel like I should revisit that idea and do it again. We've done it with a, what did we want? It was a Nomad 27 and a half with, what, well, Nomad, so 160 mil travel bike. What sort of bike do you think I should do if, if we can do that again? because um, I'm going to start exploring avenues because I think it's definitely something we should be doing on GMB and Tech. Uh, let us know in the comments underneath. In the meantime, I'm just going to leave you with the rest of these images playing up, including this spectacular puddle shot here. Uh, lovely stuff, Brad. Thank you so much for sending these images in. Okay, now it's time just to pick up the quiz answers. Okay, so the first one we said was, uh, uh, we often mention Danger Home as a builder of incredible bikes here on the Tech Channel, but what's his actual name? Anyone get it? Quite dropped enough hints. It's Gustav. Gustav Gollum. Yeah, so uh, awesome, dude. And thank you once again if you're watching, Gustav, uh, for sending us everything. We must meet up this year when uh, everything sorts itself out. Uh, next one was, what mountain bike brand used to have a team called the Fro Riders? And do you know the story? Rocky Mountain. They had the Rocky Mountain Fro Riders. Now, this is one of my very favorite stories in mountain biking. Now, in, go back to the sort of the 90s when mountain biking was changing dramatically. So it used to be thought of as a sport for people in Lycra, basically looked like roadies on mountain bikes. Now, Rocky Mountain was, as far as I know, the first team, uh, first bike company to put a team together of non-athletes, basically uh, non-competitive, non-racers, just people riding and representing a brand, taking a lot of inspiration from skiing, snowboarding, and they called them the Rocky Mountain Freeriders. But, Back in those days, bear in mind, all this is all buried. Um, this is all sort of uh, old news now. 
I got a letter from the lawyers of Cannondale who at the time were trying to patent the use of the word free ride in mountain biking, which nowadays it sounds a bit daft, doesn't it? So they had a cease and desist or something similar like that. So Rocky Mountain, instead of sort of kicking, a, kicking up a fuss about it, they just renamed themselves to the Rocky Mountain Throw Riders. And they put an aggressive advertising campaign out into all the magazines at the time. And the shots were of uh, Tippy, Schley, Simmons, people like that, with these big afros on, sitting in barbers' chairs, um, as the Throw Riders. And they used it to massive success to really sort of show the fact that, hey, we don't just care about racing, we care about riding and the love of riding and going and having a laugh on your bikes. And it worked massively for them. They were huge at that time. And uh, Cannondale, well, obviously Cannondale are still cool as anything, but uh, at the time I kind of fell flat on their face on that one. But uh, how are you? You learned, didn't you? And the next one was pivot bikes. You use which kind of rear suspension design? Yeah, we said this earlier as well, the DW linkage, the Dave Weigel linkage system. Uh, famous on their bikes in particular and IBIS for having a lot of anti-squat. So really good for standing up and climbing uh, of what I said earlier. The bikes are especially good for. Uh, really good system that. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this week's show, you got something from it. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments underneath. And don't forget to let us know about all the cool little hidden details on your bikes. I want to know what you really appreciate about your bikes. Uh, could be something on the inside, could be something in everyone's view that you just really appreciate yourselves. Um, let's show a bit of appreciation for the mountain bike and we'll see you on next week's show. See you later.